Welcome back to Mages and Murder Dads, the only show dedicated to the Baldur's Gate franchise and then beyond, and then also the Baldur's Gate franchise. I'm Cameron, and I play Ticklevar the Sorcerer. I'm Danny, and I play Balthazar, the, the slightly stealthy barbarian. What? Yeah. No, you don't. I do. You don't. I do now. You're Balthazar the Barbarian. I've 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 taken some multi class levels and people are gonna be down. so pissed off. <laughs> they wanted a they wanted solid down the line. They want barbarian. twelve and barbarian. They want twelve and barbarian. Well, I'm sorry, barbarian's front loaded. <laughs> you you get ninety percent of barbarian at level two. <laughs> That's that's kind of what the class is doing. Um, I really just went into e- into five for the extra attack. That's it. Mm-hmm. Oh God! All right. Well, give us your lies. <laughs> give us your misrepresentations and your your whodunits. Yeah. So towards the very end of Act One and towards the very beginning of Act Two, uh, Balthazar, after having you know, snagged five levels in Barbarian for the extra attack. He's a Berserker Barbarian. Now, Balthazar Mm -hmm. is picking up some levels in Rogue. Um, And the reason why Balthazar... Have mm -hmm. we ever done this thing? Okay. Berserker. Is that a thing? Balthazar likes to fight dudes. Berserker. Is this an SNL bit? (laughs) 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 (laughs)
Has that no. happened yet? Is that no. in the game yet? Okay. Unfortunately not. So, so I we've think kept the power level at, at the appropriate amount. Yeah. The, the tabletop is still a, a, like a safe place for that kind of uh, shenan- you know, sh- chicanery, as mm-hmm. it were. Mm-hmm. You, want, you, got, you went with shenanigan and then you backed out of it. Yeah, because I think that chicanery is a bit more accurate for what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very good. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Deep, deep cut. That's for that's for three people. That's for no, it's where we've talked about that on the uh, you know, the Patreon dot com slash range touch to get the range touch monthly where you just talk about random stuff for like an hour. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we've we've talked about that on that show before. OK, I believe. OK, yeah, good. Uh, 16 people. Yeah, no, I think a lot of people <laughs> listen to that. I actually, uh, you know, let's just talk about the other range touch properties in the middle of this show. I did a little poll. Where I was like, hey, if you listen to this, like, react to this post or whatever. And, like, a lot of people listen to it. Oh. And I said, I made a joke at some point. Like, I was like, you get it for free. You're not subscribing for this. And some people said, I subscribe only for this. Wow. Yeah. So, there you go. People like it. Patreon.com slash range touch. If you're not already on board. throw. If you like this show, throw us a couple dollars. Throw it, buy us a cup of coffee a month. It helps out a lot. Keeps the whole thing going. When I'm sitting here patiently editing Balthazar's goofballery. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, what are we up to? So you got you got the you got the thief. So now you're good. Wait, how do you have? G- give me your f- full run here. Like yeah. your what are all your levels in what in whatnot? First five levels in Barbarian. Level one gets you rage. Level two gets you reckless attack. Level three gets you a subclass, which is berserker. Uh, mm-hmm. That gives you the bonus action throw with no mm-hmm. penalty, yep. which is wild. Uh, four, uh, who cares? Five is the extra attack. That's the whole reason why you definitely don't want to multi-class as kind of like a quote-unquote pure martial class mm-hmm. before right. five. You're delaying your extra attack. After extra attack uh, at five, then you go into uh, rogue. Mm-hmm. You You want to get rogue until you're level three. Once you're level three, um, you're probably going to take one more level of rogue just to get the uh, ability score increase slash feat. But now, wouldn't you like one more? It's like the end of Monty Python in the meaning of life. Yeah, exactly. Wouldn't you like to have one more level of rogue? (laughs) And uh, the final arc, I'll go ahead and and spoil it. It's just going to be taking a couple levels in fighter to get um, to increase your critical hit range via the champion uh, Mm -hmm. subclass of fighter and also getting action surge. So once every, you know, short rest, you get basically a free attack. Cool. Yeah, and I think that optimally, you actually, like, when you're level 12, you respec to get, um, to do the levels in fighter first and, like, switch them. Um, but who cares? There's, that, like, there is a way to play this game where every time you level, you respec, because at every level, like, the, or, like, with every build in tabletop, mm-hmm. that build has a peak of, like, when yep. it is strongest, and with Baldur's Gate 3, you can respec your character to basically make yourself the strongest possible, you know, whatever your level is. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I imagine that is something you rarely do. Although you did mention respecking. Is this like a, is this a major turning point here at the beginning no. of Act 2? You respecking? Yeah, is is, is no. Ticklevar now a wizard? No. None okay. of that happens yet. Okay. Ticklevar is a sorcerer, canonically. Mm -hmm. I'm unwilling to break with tradition. You're not even taking the one the one wizard dip so you can scribe spells. No, because I don't care. I got I my spells come from blood, dude. Mm -hmm. Who you're going to fight with uh, the weave on this one. You're going to fight with uh, the the very fabric of magic being in your, you know, I don't. Do people have DNA in the Forgotten Realms? What do they have? That's a good question. It is a good question, right? It doesn't have to be no. what we think it is. You know what I mean? No. If the weave exists, there can be a different way that, like, her, you know, inheriting traits works. Yeah. 
I think it's like little witches and warlocks down there doing battle all the time. It's like homunculi, and you're in yeah. like a, on a microscopic level, like little hum- yeah. <laughs> little little blood homunculi. That's actually what the blood war is. We just mm. zoom in into like one. It's like one dragon's bloodstream inside and every he's like person fighting the common cold. <laughs> yeah, inside every person, there's a demon and mm-hmm. there's a devil. Yeah, which one wins? The the one Wait. with the most blood. You you hope the devil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you want really order. Do. You want pure lawful order in there. You don't want any chaos in your blood. No, but that's the thing. Sorcerers, chaotic blood. Yeah, but uh, but no, I don't. I don't dip. I do at the end of this act, which I alluded to, I believe, in the last episode. At the end of this act, I do some respecking. So, okay, but but it will require me to spoil parts of the act. Well, yeah. Let's just so uh, let's let's put a pin in it. You were uh, you went to the inner last light, did a bunch of chaos, mm-hmm. did a bunch of um, uh, things at the behest of your of your butler. Zaglubius now those Kronk. those were shenanigans, <laughs> right? What's his name again? Scalaritus Fell. Does he talk like that? Kinda, yeah. <laughs> I haven't edited any of the episodes yet where he showed up, so I can't. Oh, I that's fun. Seen. Yeah, yeah. You're going to enjoy him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have seen his hat. Yeah. I'll tell you that. That's a little hint for you. We're coming in six months of episodes. I know where his hat is. Um, but uh, yeah, so you went and did that and then presumably went to Moonrise Tower? Question mark. Yeah, actually, in the actual order of my Vo- footage. Voice goes up because question mark. Yeah, voice goes up. Oh. Mm-hmm. To Moonrise. I went to Moonrise first, actually. Oh, got gotcha. um, so you. So you, you're with the Drider. You go all the way to Moonrise. That's right. Got it. Um, and you go to Moonrise. You don't need a lantern for protection for your little trip down to Moonrise because you're you're fairy blessed. Got fairy magic. Mm-hmm. And she's like kind of pissed off about helping me, you know, because they're scamps. Sure. Like ontologically. They don't like being told what to do either. They don't, but they're too uh, small and weak to affect real change. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Balthazar's why you have to... just a big fairy. You know, that's actually the deal. That's what people mm-hmm. don't talk about. Is no. That, that he he was a uh, like a changeling at birth. He was stolen from his uh, half-orc home and sequestered. Whoa, hold on a minute. Mm-hmm. That's sequestered gag, where? <laughs> sequestered in candle keep, raised by people who were not his family. Mm-hmm. And then unleashed upon the world to do major changes and ultimately dispel illusions. That's what happened in Baldur's Gate 1, if you remember. That's true. We dispelled some illusions. Mm-hmm. Dismantled conspiracies. That's right. That is that is what fairies do. Damn. Balthazar is a big fairy. Yeah. Big fey folk Balthazar. And you know, I think that the fey folk of Forgotten Realms... They look up to him because after Balthazar's finished, I think I think they're going to have a lot more room to maneuver in the world. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, you, t- I, really, the issue is that, you know, because they're small and winged, an individual fairy has like a roaming, you know, regular roaming distance of like 500 miles square. Mm hmm. And or for our, you know, uh, uh, imperial or non-imperial, our metric listeners, 500 kilometers square. <laughs> they are equivalent. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, they need, but before humans came around, they had a lot of room before humans and other uh, PC races, right? Player player races before mm-hmm. they appeared on the world, they had a lot to do. And now they don't have as much room. But Balthazar is maybe going to help fix that. He's, he's actually champion of the Fae Falk, Balthazar. Yeah, he's from the Shadowfell. I love it. I, I'm glad. It's we, good. I'm glad we figured this out. Someone hit us with the fan art. <laughs> Bal- Balthazar in, you know what I mean? Amongst fairies in a kind of uh, uh, pseudo Renaissance style. It'll be good. Oh, I like oh, no, that. no, no, no. Like a like an English uh, late romanticism style. Right. He's got diaphanous blood flying everywhere. <laughs> Because he's bald. You're yeah, elevating yeah, yeah. it. I was just thinking Balthazar uh, held aloft by tiny, like, tooth fairy wings. That's good, like, too. Yeah. Hit us with that one. <laughs> but uh, what'd, you get, what'd you get up to in uh, Moonrise Tower? 
So Moonrise Tower's cool. Uh, act two begins the like the second you meet any merchant. Act two begins like just absolutely drenching you with magical items. Just that, that like this is really where. Uh, I think that the game's generosity goes into overdrive with respect yeah. to itemization. Um, we talked last episode about, um, you know, the struggles of the Baldur's Gate one player with their um, with their panoply of options between mundane long sword, mm-hmm. mundane short sword. Yeah. Mundane mace. Well, everything uh, is wandering <laughs> through the, the, the wilderness. Uh Oh, a lady's come to kiss me. I'm dead. <laughs> game over <laughs> yeah yep that kind of thing um but uh yeah the stuff here is really cool for the most part nothing big on itemization that balthazar needs but i imagine for a party you know a traditional party that you you're rolling with there's probably plenty of stuff that you could have picked up here are you nagging me here traditional party you are very, I mean, you're a traditional party, but with the, uh, like, a very offensive party because you don't have a rogue right now, right? You've got barbarian, fighter, uh, cleric, blaster, you know, sorcerer. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. If We're you sub personal. Yeah, if you subbed the barbarian for a rogue, that would be, like, the traditional ass fantasy party. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, not originally. Yeah, I remember the the thief was invented later. It is that's not true. canonical. No, well, that's the reason why in EverQuest we talked about the Holy Trinity, and the thief was not a part of the Holy Trinity. Because they're cursed by God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, they are held apart. Ao yeah. does not see the thief. No. Because they are hidden. It's part of their creation myth. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, cool. So you're rocking that. Yeah, so and- I, you know, I roll around and I... Um, I look at the merchants, but ultimately, if you just pop through the big doors here, you get a you get a cutscene, and this is the best villain introduction in the game, to my mind. Because you meet huh. Catherine. Yeah. Best villain introduction in the game. I think there is one later. There's not that many villains, I guess. That's part of it. Part yeah, of it. it also depends on like how how small are we getting with villain, right? Yeah. Um, I think there's one later in this act that's pretty good. Okay. Anyone, I'll just, you know, I'm not going to spoil it, uh, like, about who it is, but I'll, I'll give you the setup, and people who have played the game will know, and people who don't will be like, well, how does that happen? Anyone who's introduced sitting on top of someone else, that's pretty good. That's like Joker shit, you know what I mean? Mmm. I like that. Mm hmm. Anyway. Well, what happens here? So, yeah, we meet Kethrick and a couple of names we need to know here. There's Kethrick Thorne. He's sitting. He's he's got sweet ass armor on. He's got super cool armor. His whole head is like is coming through the place in his plate mail that looks like it's jaws. So it's got like teeth, uh, which is wild. Um, he's got a cool like gemstone in the in the middle of his uh, of his armor, and Kethrick Thorn Kethrick Thorn's face looks familiar to me, so I had to Google it. Kethrick like, Thorn's Kethrick Thorn. That's his. That's uh. That's the weapon that you should be able to get off of him. Yes, and it's like a big pike. He's a hammer wielder, unfortunately. But yeah, unfortunately, and it fun. is uh. It's that. It's it's the it's that J.K. Simmons. Hmm. That's him. It's a, you and we John. all Mhm. Killmeister Simmons. Now you might not know who this guy is. So let me uh let me No, I know me. who it is. He wants pictures of Spider-Man. He wants pictures of Spider-Man. You're drumming for him and he says, "Ah, one more time." I don't think that's how he said it. Yeah, just can you give that to me? What, nah, just give that one, to me. What you know? What you're doing great. You're, you're doing. I great. really like what I'm hearing, but I would like to hear that one more time. You know what? I'm liking that so much. I'd like to hear it again. I'd like to hear it one or two more times. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna just sit here. I just want to hear those sweet sweet beats, and we're gonna be here two or three more times. Mm-hmm. All right, sounds great to me. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get some cookies. I'm gonna get some <laughs> juice, and we're all gonna have a good old time. I just want to hear that wonderful music one more time Mm -hmm. that was him that was him yeah i don't think it looks like jk simmons at all really no not even a little bit 
Ah, uh, yeah. For me, this is visibly recognizable. A little bit more That's wrinkly. Hair's different. Hair's different. Yeah, you know, um, uh, appears to be um, a cleric of some sort of evil god. That you, yeah, you know, that doesn't really happen in uh, Burn After Reading. No, it doesn't happen in Burn After Reading. And also, I right clicked him, and he's undead. Although, although he does play a harper in that movie. Thinking he about does it. play a harper in that movie. He does play a harper, so maybe that's part of the extended Baldur's Gate universe. Mm hmm. Huh. But he's not a harper in this game. Notably, he is just some bad guy. As far he's as some bad guy. Um. Yeah. So Kethrick Thorns there. Zrel uh, is a half orc woman who has like a robe on, some kind of caster, and she seems like the kind of like the 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 big assistant. You know, the secretary slash right hand woman of Kethrick Thorn here in this throne room, and they are. Asking some goblins about how things went. <laughs> mm -hmm. And these are the goblins. Um, I, I think I might recognize one from like a cutscene in the goblin area. Not 100% sure. It could just be that they're just they kind of just made sure that I knew as a player. Hey, these are the goblins from the Shattered Sanctuary from the goblin camp. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I walk in and I'm I'm overhearing this uh, this interrogation. They're kind of like holding court here, and the goblins are having to explain themselves. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is there are a couple of dialogue cues that can happen if you are dark urge, but I think I somehow miss them. Huh? Uh, but they can happen as dark urge, where Kethrick Thorne like seems a little surprised that you're here. Kethrick Thorne says, doesn't say like, oh, who are you? Kethrick Thorne recognizes me. Wait, so that this doesn't happen for you or it does happen for you? So on one, so I think that this is the thing is like, I, I did have to like reload at, at some point because of this, because there was actually like, I didn't crash too many times in this game, but I crashed. I do remember I crashed after this cutscene and I had to replay it. Huh? Um, this game, I, we're going to get more like the longer this season goes on, I have a feeling we're going to be talking more and more about bugs. Um, but uh, so far, relatively rare uh, bugs. In any case, there is a dialogue where Kethrick can say that. But in the version, in the footage that I have from like my, this save, he does not. But I just know that some behind some dialogue choice, I... I don't know what happened. In any case, Kethrick asks me, what do you think? Uh, what do you think should happen to these old goblins? And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you know, they're, they're goblins. Just just kill them. They're no good. Um, and the goblins get really angry and they throw a, uh, you know, bad security here. They throw a spear directly into Kethrick Thorne's chest. Like, like oh, I, th I thought it was like the neck region. Oh, no, it's not even a spear. I'm looking at the footage now. It's a big old, like, halberd slash polearm. Yeah. And it is from, it's from, like, below his, uh, like, nipple on his chest all the way up to his shoulder. It's, That's like, right. practically right. cutting him in half. Yeah. And it looks like he's dead, and then immediately he pops up out of his throne. He, he pulls it out of his chest. He drops it. At the goblin's feet and says, try again. The goblin then picks it up and swings at his neck, almost cutting his head off. And then he pulls it out. And then he just does a wrestling maneuver where he like balls his two hands up and smashes the goblin's head. And then he tells Zarel to dispose of the rest of them as we see fit. Huh. Yeah. What do you what, what any? And did you have any other different interactions here? I don't think this can go all that different. Like, yeah. you can even be kind of sassy to him, and it still kind of railroads you through the conversation to him, asking you to do whatever you want to do with the goblins, I believe. Gotcha. And at the very end, just as he leaves, this is the little bit of dialogue I remember. But now that I'm looking through the footage, it's like it wasn't at the beginning when I was actually interacting with him. It's as he's walking away. He says, mm -hmm. let us take advantage of our surprising guest and their particular creative genius. Uh-huh. Yeah. 
So he does recognize me. And he knows I'm good at murdering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how does he know that? I think we're going to figure that out, this act. Oh. Yeah. We're All gonna right. We're going to get some really interesting stuff going on in episode 10, I think. I'm hearing you. Yeah. Hmm. Episode 10. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you don't mean episode 9? Uh, we're in uh, episode 8. That's correct. Yeah, and I'm 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 highlighting it. Uh, oh, here. I see. I got, yeah. I'm just making sure. I'm making sure mm -hmm. you're on the money. Mm -hmm. you know, don't you try to keep me honest on the money. I'm making sure you're on the money. So what happens? So Cuthric Thorn gets up, Bebop's on up his little tower, and this all basically happens the same for me too, uh, nearly identical. And then you have to talk to Zarel, his like number two. She's mm -hmm. a cleric, maybe a wizard. What's she? Do we know? I got I kind of got sorcerer vibes uh, from Zrell, but I mean, we're going to find out that she's kind of like a psionicist. That's kind of her deal. Yeah. Yeah. It's not really its own thing in this universe, though. Right. Or in this, it like, version of the thing. I don't know if that's its own thing in fifth edition either. Uh, really at this point, probably in a splat book somewhere. But, right. Um, but yeah, I do know, you know, we're going to find out there's going to be a battle with Zrell mm -hmm. later, at least for me. Um, and I'll mm -hmm. be able to like look through the footage and kind of ascertain what, what spell list she's pulling from. Well, she like immediately when you talk to her uh, as you explore the tower in like just a minute, she like kills an ogre with her mind for fun. Yes, that's actually her. That's her special ability is kill you with a thought. Yeah. That's she can sever the the strands of life, yeah. Oh, my God! Like a Norn! Like a Norn. Oh, my God! She's Norn! She's, she's, she's got Norn blood! <laughs> ah, Balthazar, I see you have Norn blood from the Fey folk. Um, the, uh... So what did you do with these goblins? I told them uh, I, I used my bug power to force them to eviscerate themselves. What? Yeah, I just looked at That's them and bad. I and I That's thought bad stuff. Make me make me run me a bath of blood. What? And then their eyes glow, you know, started glowing purple. And then they stabbed themselves in the stomach. Lord. Yeah. I smiled when I did it, so I know that my character Balthazar liked it. Is a real scamp. I, I I will say, making the thumbnails for these, a lot of Balthazar smiling. <laughs> it's he, you know he he finds his joy, you know. Yeah, he's he's looking through all. He's thinking about all of the things he could mm -hmm. do. I could go mow the lawn. Mm, frown. That does not bring me joy. Yeah. Right. I could do some laundry. Mm, frown. Mm -hmm. Does not bring me joy. Ooh, could. Force goblins to eviscerate themselves. That brings me joy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. The, uh, I just let him go. Ticklevar says, well, look, if there's a choice you have to make between killing the goblins, and I guess the opposite of that would be exalting the goblins, making them your god, uh, following their every whim. Yeah. Um, and chasing them into the afterlife. Uh, as a kind of um, maximal spirit of sorcerer prowess, right? Mm -hmm. You got to choose the thing in the middle, which is ignoring them. When in doubt, say nothing. When in doubt, ignore them. Yeah. Ticklevar lets them go. And everyone says, why'd you do that? And it says, oh, interesting. they're goblins. They're goblins. There's a spell plague out there, whatever the hell it is, shadow curse. They'll they'll get up to their own deal. Mm. Yeah. So they run out. I think this might be uh, the conclusion of a quest that we both of us did not complete. Which one is that? So do you remember Saza? Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So Saza was the goblin NPC that was imprisoned in the Druid's Grove. Yep. Um, if you escort her to the Shattered Sanctum, which I don't think either of us did. No. Um, she'll actually there's a lot of like additional dialogue you can get of like uh, getting past the guards like she basically gives you a free ride. You don't have to do any checks on your way in. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually when she confronts uh, Minthara and she tells uh, Minthara like, hey, I brought these these idiots to you. Minthara's like, oh, these 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 idiots are true souls. You you messed up, Saza. You you mis ID them. Uh, you can save uh, Saza then. 
Hmm. Um, and if you saved her then, then she will be at the audience chamber in Moonrise Towers. Uh, and like, so it will be Saza instead of these two random goblins. And if you save her once again in Act Two, uh, you get a uh, you get an achievement. She cannot be caged. Huh? Yeah. If you got to rescue her from Emerald Grove, the Goblin Camp, and Moonrise Towers in one playthrough. Huh? The road not traveled. Cameron. Of course. Mm -hmm. Well, they went down the road out of my goddamn game. <laughs> I don't yep. think I ever saw him again. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they go out and do that. And then because everyone, both of our games, because everyone thinks you're like, I mean, you, I guess you are a true soul, right? True souls being uh, people who are infected with a tadpole. Even though most true souls don't know that. Is that true? They don't yeah. know they got a bug in their brain. Yeah. So like priestess gut had a bug in her brain. She was not aware that 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 being a true soul was getting a bug in your brain. Oh, huh. oh, huh. yeah, no, right. there, there, there are like, so there are, I think that like most true souls, in fact, mm -hmm. are, are like, they think that they're, they're like, we're just good at psionics now. <laughs> yeah, they, they think that they are just uh, chosen by the absolute and they've been blessed in some way. Um, I do think that there's evidence here in act two to say that like the upper echelon of, of true souls. Sure. Like Zrel mm -hmm. no prob Zrel probably knows, but there's a, there's a little bit of plausible deniability there, huh? Interesting. Mm -hmm. The uh, but yeah, so we just get the ability to like doodle all around basically and like do whatever you want. You can't go to the tippy top of the tower because Catherick Thorne is there doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know he's like up there chanting or something we don't really know but you can't mm -hmm. get to the top of the tower you're not supposed to but you can kind of go anywhere else you want there's a couple quests you can pick up here um one is uh finding balthazar and i bet oh, you said, i get but so I'm, but angry. I'm right here i'm so like, I'm angry right here. I'm balthazar. we've already done this in a game we did already do this in a game we did already balthazar one time mm-hmm uh, throne of the, ball, uh, right? Throne of ball. Mm -hmm. The uh, but yeah, so basically, there's a Catherick Thorne's got got a crew. You know, that's 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 the version of uh, uh you know, uh, Andre the Giant's got a posse. Catherick Thorne's got a got a crew, right? Mm -hmm. His crew is Zarel. His crew is Balthazar, yeah. right? And there's some like other hangers on, but those are the two primary. There's like the bugbear merchant. I guess he's part of the crew, technically. Sure. But basically what you see in Moonrise Towers is you are seeing Kethrick Thorne's camp, right? Like when we go to camp and we got all our guys hanging out, this is his camp, which is it's fun. his hub. Yeah, yeah, it's his hub. It's where it's it's how he's waging this war. Yeah. When he when he is wandering around the map and he says, "Oop, I need to sleep and he clicks the little button. This is where he goes back to. Yeah. He teleports here. It, I like that. I like yeah. a base. I like a Suikoden, you know what I mean? Well, I'm and a also, simple guy. There's point I like and a Nino Kuni too. I'm a simple person. Oh, I love it. Uh, and there's point and counterpoint here because we have Kethrick's base and we've got like the Harper base. Or hey, you do. You know, there's a, you do, you know there's a new game coming out from the Suikoden people this year? No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna you're messing me up, buddy. I'm I've got to finish. I got to finish my honor mode run. Oh, I'm messing you up. You got a couple months, I think. I think you got okay. it. But, oh, yeah, we're in it. We're going. That, well, that's Mages and Murder Dad's next season. Just playing a random, brand new <laughs> game in the Suikoden <laughs> lineage. Oh. I'm sure there's some threads, right? Yeah, why not? How I mean, I figured when I was doing go. all that research uh, back in the day, or not back in the day, but, you know, a while back, I found out that Baldur's Gate 2 only has romances because the developers looked at the fan response to Final Fantasy 7 and they were like we got to get that in there. Mhm. Mm so yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, I'm sure there's something. Um uh, but uh but yeah, so that this is his crew, these are his people and you kind of wander around and talk to them. You can pick up a quest. Uh there's a necromancer named Balthazar who is like helping Kethrick Thorn out because he is as we have seen already immortal in some way. And He's immortal and the dream guardian even will will like ping your brain. You'll get a little notification if this yeah. were if this were, you know, 
premium television, a little text bubble would appear on the screen, like mm-hmm. five feet wide. Um, and the Dream Guardian says, hey, you're not ready to face Kethrick Thorne. You, you got you to gotta do some, you, you got to figure out how to circumvent his, oh, I don't know, immortality. Right. His invulnerability, basically. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm a simple man as a player. But I'm thinking, okay, well, if somebody, if some entity's wandering around the world, invulnerable, immortal, mm-hmm. usually, like, if they're a lich, there's a phylactery at play, right? Yeah. If if there's, you know, if so, like, even Vlocketh, Vlocketh's got one of those, right? Yeah. We don't know where it is. Could be anywhere in the astral plane. Uh-huh. But. Say Catherine, more. Yeah, but. So we know that Kethrick Thorm has some, there's some power that's like fueling this immortality. And we are given like, like some information about Balthazar's doing some work for him that's really important. So, you know, you're kind of thinking, oh, is that maybe related? Is there something going on there? Right. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so we're pr- provoked to do that. And Balthazar is like doing something involving that in a crypt somewhere. Sure. So we can like poke around. You, uh, Zarel is like, you can go, hey, go find this guy. And you can poke around in his like little apartment here in order to figure out where he's at. And mm-hmm. this dude's, he's a sicko. He is a sicko. Yeah. He's got some mean traps in his bedroom. He does. He's got That's- a bookshelf that its only purpose is just to absolutely starch people. Yeah, that definitely doesn't happen in my game, for sure. <laughs> There's like no footage of me just like repeatedly getting nuked by this bookshelf. For no, to no end. There's not anything. Be, is there even anything being guarded I think there? I, yeah, I mean, I think there's some like things. Scrolls. That don't yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the uh, but yeah, you can like you figure it out. But yeah, he's a necromancer and he's like the grossest kind. You know what I mean? Sure. He is. He is not. Uh, like just some guy with some spikes on him who's like doing teal magic in the world, right? He is, exactly. he is like ripping people apart and putting them back together again. Yeah. And uh, for Balthazar, because I don't have any way to like get the shadow curse at bay, I only got two Moonrise because I was like, you know, hugging a drider, like basically holding onto a drider leg at the dry as the drider like led me here. Yeah. Uh, Zrel says, Hey, I think that Balthazar had like a spare lantern, mm-hmm. uh, like a moon lantern. So I'm able to pick one of those up in Balthazar's suite. You can also explore more. And with my sleight of hand gloves and like my guidance necklace and like all of these things, I'm able to lock- pick the lock to Kethrick's apartment. Where did you, did you poke around in there? Uh, no, I've oh, never damn. across any of my games. I've never attempted to do this. Yeah, he's got a he's got a bony dog. He's got a skeleton dog. That's like alive. Yeah, it's like an undead skeleton dog. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happens? Does it attack you? I use some animal handling to defuse the situation. So it's got like a big comical bomb fuse coming out of it is what you're saying. Exactly. I don't understand um, metaphors. You're going to have to help me out here. It's true. Um, but the dog doesn't bother me. I am able to like poke around and you do see there are a couple of things that kind of stick out. You see a lot of writing he's done about his dead wife and you can find out that his wife was a cleric of saloon. So there was, the, you know, I'm getting a little bit of the arc of Kethrick's kind of character in terms of this is a this is a character who has fallen from grace. This is a character who at one time was not a Shar worshiper, but you know there was you know th- there was kind of like a point in the time where he was like kind of a good guy, and then his wife died, and then he became he like transitioned from saloon worship to Shar worship, and he was involved in a bunch of bad stuff after that. And then there's kind of question mark, question mark, because now, obviously, he's not serving Shar. He's serving the absolute. So what's going on there? Huh. Yeah, we don't know who he is serving the absolute at this point, right? That's, That's what, what we, we know. know. That's what right. we know. Okay. Yeah. 
We it just is know interesting that that, mm-hmm. that 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 will change at some point, and it it feels to me still second time through the game that that kind of comes out of nowhere. Yeah, no, and you know we talked about it uh, last episode. Sometimes plot beats just get dropped on you from a letter, and sometimes plot drop beats just kind of get dropped on you in a cinematic, and that's what's going to happen in Baldur's Gate three. Uh, but yeah, it's we're. We're going to have a lot to talk about at the end of this act, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think so, too. Because there, there is a gear shift that happens there. Truly. Um, so, yeah, uh, I poke around uh, in his apartment. I look around. There's some like there's a cool cloak in here at some point. I'm wearing that now in the footage. And mm-hmm. I. Uh, What's it do for you? Oh, it's just like some bonus. No, it, like it doesn't matter because I, I like a lot of the bonuses I get if they're not just adding to throwing damage they don't matter mm-hmm. because that's how I'm navigating the game I'm like right. a single tool that does one thing and when I'm in an environment with like gnarly roots or stalactites and my mm-hmm. throwing arc is interrupted even though I can see the enemy my throwing arc is interrupted Balthazar gets sad <laughs> Because it's like taking a specialized tool. It's like taking a Dremel, and you're like, "Oh, well, you need to you need to cut this two by four. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, only through toward the end of the game did I start getting like kind of pissed off about the like, why can this creature not see this other creature? Sure, there are some there are some level design things going on later in this game that are like actively frustrating. I'm going to be honest. I uh, my theory is that Act One just got so much playtesting time in the yeah. early access that all of the so many of the rough spots got sanded off, mm-hmm. and you have a lot of battle arenas in Act at the you know in Act Two and Act Three that just did not get those iterations, those like little tweaks over time. Right. Mm-hmm. right. In any case. Uh, Balthazar also just kind of looks around the tower in general. I meet some cool people. Did you meet the gnolls? Mm, yes. Yeah, they're 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 they're, in the they're really they're they are in the kitchen. They're trying to uh, that that the cult of the absolute's a pretty inclusive spot. They're they're really trying. Everybody's invited, you know. Mm-hmm. Did you well, did you? <laughs> that's kind of what's happening, right? Uh, these gnolls are being like mind dominated. Yeah. And being like taught language against their will. Mm hmm. So. I guess what you're saying is correct <laughs> in a big technical way. Like the Borg. The Borg are big. Ter- <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I don't, you know. I, I guess I agree. It's sad. And I believe mm-hmm. that I freed them. I don't I don't remember what I did exactly with them. Let me let me look at the footage. Let me mm-hmm. look at the old footerino here. Do, 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 I can talk do. about uh Araj while you're doing that, if you Please. wish. Please. So I meet a drow named Araj Obladra. Oblodra. Oblodra. Clearly you don't know jack shit. About, about underdark pronunciation, the, uh, the noble, the, the Menzo noble Baranzons. house. <laughs> yes, House of Lodra, which was originally part one of the many houses in Menzo Baranzan, underneath House Bainry, when House Bainry remained the the top dog house of Menzo Baranzan, and uh, House of Lodra was famous for having uh, warped their whatever they have other than DNA, their blood, uh, with illithid. Stuff they they got a lot of that kind of shit going on. They're like doing some some crossing of species and all kinds of things going on there. And they've got psionic abilities, mm. so they are not they are they are not uh you know if uh, Loth's disfavor comes upon you right you can't defend yourself because your priestess's magic doesn't work right. Sure, if you've got psionic abilities, no priestess involved in that shit. Oh, you can still yeah, keep doing it. I remember this being a plot point and like there was a novel set in the time of troubles. Yes, I think underdark. that my knowledge of this comes from, uh, I think, one of the early Drizzt Dorton books. Mm-hmm. It's in one of them that I read a couple of years ago. But uh, but yeah, so they so there's a lot of history behind her. And currently, canonically, 
you know, a uh, hundred years after the ball spawn crisis, I believe that they are a scattered house. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. there you go. In any case, she's looking for some cool blood. She likes blood. Yeah. Um, and this is, uh, I pop into my camp. I grab a Starian. I bring him back here. Um, and she says, oh, wow. This guy's, I, I, I can tell, this guy's got some weird blood stuff going on. This guy looks like a vampire. Mm-hmm. And I say, sure enough, he's my vampire. My pat, pat, <laughs> little stare on the, on the, on the back. This guy's mm-hmm. my vampire. And, yep. uh, and she says, well, I am willing to give you something real cool if you have him drink my blood. Like, I want to experience that for uh-huh. science. Just have him take a sip. And Asterion turns to me and he's like, please don't make me do this. There's her blood. Like, I can smell it from here. It smells bad. There's bad stuff in there. And I say, my dude, just just take the sip. Mm-hmm. And he's like, no, I would yeah, never really do it. bullying this dude's ass into doing it. And I say, don't be dramatic. Take the bite. Jeez. And he gets so angry. And then he kind of like, I do like that the the way that they've done the acting is like once I've like bullied him and he's decided he has like this feigned, okay, I'm going to bite you. And mm-hmm. he does so for a few seconds. And then he just starts coughing and like, oh, it's so awful. It's bad. And he's like, oh, but he's fine. He's fine. Yeah, do we want to talk about his uh, plot line here and why this matters? Well, here's the interesting thing. I've never done it. Uh, I mean, I'm aware. I've also never done it, but I'm aware of it. Mm, Okay, go for it. The basic pitch behind it, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding of the the Asterian, so leave a comment if you have more uh, information to share here. But uh, my understanding of the Asterian thing is that basically he's been this... um, uh, for his vampire master, right? Who we don't. Yeah, know because much there about are vampires, yet. and then there are vampire spawn, and a vampire yeah. spawn is like you don't complete the full ritual and process of becoming a quote unquote true vampire. Well, you're also just like kind of like um, you're a little bit enslaved, right? Yeah, you're a thrall. Mm-hmm. You you are kept depowered, right? So it's not like you didn't do all the right stuff. It is you are being prevented from being like a true vampire. Yeah, because in order to become a true vampire, you have to drink the blood of the you know the vampire that turned you. Okay, sure. Yeah, he says it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the so, so what's going on is like, and later in the game you can find this out too. Even if you don't ever talk to Asterion, like I said last time, I still never really talked to Asterion. But basically, he was the kind of like enslaved, um, uh, what do you call it? Kind of like attractant for his vampire lord. So he's like going out and seducing all these people and bringing them in. And so his, I think there's this strong association with the Asterian character with doing vampire stuff, with having to do, uh, doing things you don't want to do, right? Being forced into these things. And there's this kind of sexual dynamic to it too, you know, that's that's part of a lot of vampire lore. Mm-hmm. And so I think the way that we are supposed, even though this is like, in its uh, singularity, right? It's taken as a kind of like, Asterian, why don't you just do the thing you're supposed to do, right? Like, we're all in a video game here. I think the way if you if you are buddied up to Asterian, right? Oh, you definitely would see the the what's going on in terms of non-consent. Right, in exactly. I think it's supposed to like hit a different thing, but I'm with you because I didn't have that. I did, I've resolved this in a very similar way. And I was like, what is the deal? You're a vampire. You know what I mean? So it is interesting how these scenes, I think it's cool. I think it's a benefit, not even just interesting. I think it's cool that these scenes that, um, just like in real life, right, can play very differently based on the amount of information you have about somebody. Right? And I think that this is a divisive point of this game, to be honest. And yeah. I think that there are, yeah. th- like, it really, this kind of thing informs a lot of players, a lot of specific players that are looking for a specific, like, experience. Yeah. It informs how they interact with this game and their attitude towards it. I Oh, I think- I'm sure that there are people who just heard my summary of that and find it infuriating because I have not taken into account the full sum total of Asterian as a character, which for lots of people, and this works this way in lots of video games, we've talked about this a lot um, over on Homestuck Made This World, yeah. uh, Michael and I, right? This The idea that 
the whole experience is the thing you need to be aware of that informs your understanding of every moment, right? And so like yeah. player phenomenally, this is an interesting scene that plays a very different way for you and I than it does for someone who has been invested in the Asterian, um, you know, plot line. And that is actually good narrative design, right? It's good narrative design that you can have a complex character where partial knowledge might tell you something different than someone else. But I think you're right. I think even at this point, um, there are a lot of fandom dynamics going on in this game that maybe doesn't find that as appealing as as I do. Yeah, and I think that the big question, one of the big questions that I did not have, that I did not want to address or wrestle with when we started mm -hmm. recording the show, but as we move along, it's kind of looming in my brain. It's, ter it, it's in terms of like how to evaluate these kinds of specific, very, uh, these kinds of art forms that have these incredibly contingent elements, right, mm -hmm. uh, of experience. And I think that our, like, even our decision, we, we, we've only, at this point, we've published one episode. But I think that there were some people that were like, oh, my gosh, I cannot believe Gail is not a part of this. Right? Yeah. Or yeah. I cannot believe Will is just not going to be a part of this game. But they I don't think know that, that yet by that point. <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> They're going to find that out shortly. Yep. Um, I, uh, I just think it's so interesting because I think we're kind of primed from a period of, you know, our previous playthroughs of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2 where you can't have a playthrough where you play with all the companions because like they all level up separately you kind of do have to like choose some lanes you know uh, no you can you can yeah, it just the game and this does actually make it some things that we saw around release make a lot more sense to me is that mm. there are lots of people playing the game who are just rotating out constantly Gotcha. In order to get all those like story beats and all those things. And I, God, that's got to add 50 hours to your playtime. It, right? it must. But, yeah. And that's just, like, I guess, irrespective of what you could or could not do in BG one or two. Neither of us ever did that. Um, I don't think that's ever been like a, no. a thing that we did in the show or even just like if we were playing that game before. Um, no, you know, I pick you a party mm -hmm. and I play the game with the party. Yeah. And uh, if I want to get the other party experience, I just play with a different party. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. We're we're playing this game in a, in a way that we are going to not be in on all of the lore for large stretches of the time of the time. Um, yeah. And we're, we're just going to have incomplete information. We're gonna, our characters are going to be reacting and interacting with the world from positions of partial information or ignorance. Yeah. And I do think that that's that is cool. But also, if you are only going to play Baldur's Gate three once. Mm hmm. <laughs> and I think this is the thing is like because it's a big game and I don't think it's unfair for like the average person to be like, you know what? I'm playing this game once. Do you think most people, if you were like my my buddy Scott, who mm -hmm. killed uh, Carlac without ever <laughs> talking to her, he saw he saw her across the river and killed her. If you were like my buddy Scott, who saw the portal. Uh, that Gail's hand was sticking out of him was like, well, that's dangerous. I'm not interacting with that. Yeah. And just like played the whole game and had this whole experience with the, with those uh, parts removed. You yeah. know, what is what is the what is the effect of that? How what is the attitude that the player will end up having to be like, did they feel like they missed something or did they feel like this was a completely intentional? The fact that they missed it was completely intentional and, and built know. in. You know, I, I that's it's that's a complicated question. It is a guy. Yeah, I have no idea. What does he feel like? Is he like, oh, I missed something? So I think that for Scott, it's like, oh, well, I'll play it again. I'll play it again and get those yeah. experiences. But I do wonder what I wonder is for the people who are only going to play once is is the go to move. OK, just open a Wikipedia so that you can like cherry pick all of the experiences that you want to have and not quote unquote miss them. I I think that the varieties of play are so wide that yeah. it's hard to answer that question. I, I think to do that. You have to be a level of knowledgeable player to be like, there's a big wiki that I could find and read the like startup guide. Yeah. Um, but it's clear that there was a huge amount of people looking for that information at, when this game launched because every website. Right. And this is it's an, it's an SEO race. Right. You if you begin to see every website, um, you know, games website or whatever, publishing something very similar in the kind of guides direction, it is because 
those are SEO terms that are showing up, right? Um, yeah. And whether that's because someone on the team is really good at predicting that stuff or whether that is uh, because they are following a trend and they're trying to get certain keywords up, right? Whatever, whatever way the wind is blowing, it does tell you that there is desire, right? Yeah. Uh, and here's what you should know in the first five hours of Baldur's Gate 3 was the style of article that was. don't make these five mistakes right and those things mm -hmm. like still hit right there, sure. there are videos on YouTube of that kind of thing with like millions of views on them still um, that are still accruing stuff because people are continuing to play the game the this, this game has enough people still entering it that they are releasing a new physical edition, right? It, uh, it, because that is going to capture not just a already people who have played and then also additional people, right? So um, it, it's still in a growth area as far as I can tell. So I, you know, I think that most people probably just play the game and they play it one time. And if they didn't see something that is an evocation of, wow, this game is huge and big. Sure. I don't think most people do what we do. Like, I don't think the majority of people do what we do, which is like learning about every possible quest and then figuring out how we can route them. You know? Yeah. Or I um, think that, you know, we, we did the even more maximalist thing of one playthrough without information. Yeah. And then <laughs> and then yeah. cracking it open. But also yeah. we were constantly talking to each other across those playthroughs. And mm -hmm. between the two of us, we experienced everything in the game as far as I know. Yeah. Like, I think I hit a couple things you didn't, but I think you you probably hit 95% your first time through. Maybe. Of the experiences that could have been afforded, given yeah. the, the decisions I made. Um, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting little moment there. But the upshot is uh, a little potion that gives me plus two strength. So, let's do the uh, strength math. Start at 16 strength for Balthazar. Get plus one for Tavern Brawler. Get mm -hmm. plus one from making a deal with Auntie Ethel, and now mm -hmm. uh, plus two from the uh, from this potion. So yeah, up to up to twenty strength, really good. Yeah, I uh, th this quest keeps going. I gave her my blood. I did. I did all the same things you did. Yeah. Did have you finished this quest? You know how this quest ends in Act Three. I do. It's very good. Yeah, we'll talk about it. I think we'll, we'll make room for it. It's good. Oh, we absolutely will. Uh, I I do know what I did with the gnolls. I cl I selected an option. I've I, Ticklefar has used his brain powers like three times total in the whole okay. playthrough, and this one is one where I had the option of sever sever her connection for good, and I thought that would free the gnolls mm. from her mind powers. It did not free the gnolls. It killed them. Hmm. So I killed the gnolls with my brain powers. Dang, did you get experience? I don't know, maybe. Mm -hmm. I wasn't looking that close. Yeah. But uh, I, that's the most Balthazar asked question you could be asking. It's true. Did you get experience? <laughs> did you get experience? I am wearing, by the way, the Cat's Grace. Do you know about this thing? Yes. This cloth that is... armor that just sets your dexterity to 18 and gives you. Um, uh, advantage on like everything dexterity oriented gives advantage on all dexterity checks and also gives you uh, resistance to falling damage. Uh, it's sold mm -hmm. by the woman who is looking to get that Githyanki egg. Oh, right. And you so can I actually bought this back when I talked to the, the Githyanki egg lady. Yeah. Who, who's wearing it? I didn't know that. Oh, no. But oh, who, oh, who oh, do, I thought you were saying she is wearing it. Uh, who's on first? <laughs> mm hmm. Uh, the uh, Ticklevar wears it. Oh, wow, yeah. Just increasing that AC. Uh, throughout the rest of the game, Ticklevar will carry this piece of armor, and anytime I need to lockpick something, he will put it on. Yeah. And will lockpick the hell out of it. So, it works no, great. It's fantastic. It's, uh, it really is... I slept on that uh, item. Like, I looked at it, and it just didn't really click how good Cat's Grace is, but it's way better than the sleight of hand gloves. Yeah, um, because it's all dexterity checks, which includes stealth. Mm -hmm. uh, so really great item, kind of uh, a little bit of monk itemization, but it's one of those monk items that casters can wear perfectly well and maybe even some unarmored barbarian builds, too. We'll talk about this, but there is some like real horse shit around monk items in this game. Mm. I cannot tell you the number of quests that, I, you know, we talked about this in the Underdark a little bit with those gloves, yeah. right? But like the number of quests across this game where it ends and you get the little pop up of like, you got the 
the the staff of whipping ass or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Or like you know the cloak of of ass kicking, and it's like blah blah blah. And then you know it's like some minor effect, really. And then the major effect is like you're on. You can do two more un- unarmed attacks per round or whatever, right? You know you gets this like or your unarmed effect uh, attacks do like plus four fire damage each. When you use an unarmed attack to push an enemy and they take falling damage, the falling damage gets five more damage. Right. There's just like weird. <laughs> and I'm like, why is that not? There's nothing for sorcerers like that. I think across this whole game, the only thing I found for sorcerers that's like a straight good item for sorcerers is a hat. Oh, that's a shame. So you missed out the bard's cloak in no, the, the what, last light in? No, I have it too. I okay. Because that's phenomenal. That adds wait, it's your... A, wait, it's a cloak or it's I, a uh, it's robe? Like clothing. It's a robe. I have yeah. the robe too, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, but that, even that's not, that's not that good of an item. It adds... Your charisma, your charisma mod to, to cantrips. Yeah. Well, look, I'm just telling you, at the end of this game, mm-hmm. being able to, like, uh, firebolt or whatever for 27 damage is cool, but not earth-shattering. No, that's it's true. It's not the same as being able to hit an additional time. Or I think the problem is cantrips are really good if you are in a mode where you cannot rest a lot because it costs a lot of supplies to rest, and you kind of yeah. have to be really diligent. And in yeah. that way, being able to, like, boost your cantrips lets you, go, you know, go longer and save mm-hmm. your big spells. Yeah. But in balanced difficulty, you really need to be short resting after every fight. And when you are missing short rest, you need to long rest. Because especially yeah. as a sorcerer, it's like, hey, you got fireball, buddy. You want to you mm-hmm. cast fireball every fight. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do that. Don't deprive yourself of that. So, no, I, that makes sense that, like, yeah, a, an additional yeah. couple of damage to Firebolt isn't that great. Every fight opens with uh, somewhere around here, right? A Fireball <laughs> or an Ice Storm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Tickovar only casts AoE. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, occasionally we get the Firebolt for 30 or whatever. But for the most part, we are just obliterating multiple people at one time because that's cool to do why would mm-hmm. it as you just said why would i deny myself yeah. the pleasures of the sorcerer and as you i think mentioned in the opening episode there's probably some uh fights that begin with fireball quicken spell yeah bonus action fireball <laughs> yes that's a non-zero number of fights mm-hmm. uh I will say, though, having just basically only chosen offensive spells that are AOE attacks, sometimes uh, Ticklevar doesn't have a lot to do in combat. <laughs> yeah, other than yeah. Shoot a cantrip or whatever. That's when you're happy you got the cantrip damage. Cause, yeah, because yeah. you're... Because hey, unlike, you know uh, <laughs> when it's not helpful is when you can't see the person. Sure. Due to, like... I like Warzone three head glitch issues. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's like that. It's like, can I get in his POV and, like, have Ticklevar stand on tippy toes for two seconds? Because What's I can really definitely see the line of sight here. For sh- uh, this is especially bad and especially hard for the shorter races. Um, oh my god! If you are a halfling, I didn't even think about it. If you are a halfling, your you know it draws an arc from your bow, right? Well, let Chest me let high me, walls or head high walls. If you're a halfling, let me tell you something. When you are just shooting your bow as a halfling, you're kind of like you've just got a normal, normal ass bow shooting stance. Right. But when you select the sneak attack option, you crouch into a tactical sneak attack stance. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are hits you can make with the normal (laughs) stance Uh. that you all of a sudden cannot when your head is three inches shorter. Now, luckily in the game, you can set a reaction to like automatically apply the sneak attack damage Mm -hmm. if you are eligible for it. So you don't have to manually select. But it is that is how much like it it, it took playing a rogue for me to understand. Oh, my God, that is how like granular this is. That it is drawing a actual line from your character model. And if your character model stance changes, it matters. And uh, guess what? Tactical view least helpful thing on the planet for this yeah because it is a combat engine that determine that is dependent on three dimensions yeah tactical view is not helping me out here but no and it's still and it's a problem for like things about like a level above you and there's like yeah yeah uh this is not just complaint these are like real these are things that begin to appear at about this point in the game 
You yep. know what I mean? Like real things. And in fact, kind of ended up mattering for a thing I did that maybe you didn't. Did you go down to the prison below? Here's the thing. I did not do the prison this run through. So you can uh, you can talk a lot about that. <laughs> so we know that Zevlor has been he's, he's disappeared, presumed he's dis- to be kidnapped. He has disappeared in your game. He's very dead in mine. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> he's disappeared in my game. Mm hmm. Zevlor's disappeared. We got the chief. Like, remember, I talked to Roland and he's like, my two buddies are disappeared. You know, they yeah. they are they are gone. Uh, when you talk to I don't I don't have that robe at this point because I have spoken to the bard and she's like, my best friend's gone. Maybe maybe they're closer than friends. I don't know. I can't remember. But I got a chiefling companion who was also not here. Uh Oh, you know, we got that going on. Right. Mm-hmm. And so there's a bunch of tiefling. So I have a quest that I have two quests that are that seem to be the same quest at this point, right? One is like, and actually I've got three. I've got find the tieflings, okay? Find Zevlor, which is a separate thing, and then find Maul. Remember who got abducted by winged horrors? That's in right. The previous episode. So I got all that, and those all kind of have you know quest markers in the tower. So so I know there's a prison. I go down into the prison, and I do a little some scouting around. In the cells, there are two different groups of people. There are uh, tieflings. It's the mm-hmm. tieflings I, they, you know, is it me you, you're looking for? These are the tieflings I've been looking for. Yes. And then there are some deep gnomes down there. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, Ooh, okay. One of the deep gnomes says, and I don't remember who this is. Do you remember what what the name of this deep gnome is? By any is it is it Wolbrin? Is it the head guy that you're talking? It to? It is Wolbrin, the guy who I couldn't remember before. Yeah, it is Wolbrin, and I can say I saw Barkus down in the Grim Forge. He told me you were here. I've been. I'm now. I'm here to rescue you. Right. Yeah. And so I didn't I didn't actually do that. I didn't say Barkus told me to do blah, blah, blah. I was like, I know these tieflings. I'm going to get you out, too. And he says, look, I'm good at escaping shit because I'm, you know, a gnome, I guess. Yeah, because I have stone affinity because his name is Wolburn Bongle. That's why, <laughs> you know, if, if, if you meet a Wolburn Bongle in the road, ask him about rocks. Imagine being a deputy warden at a state prison and you're yeah, looking and through Wolbert the new Wolbert the deep gnome shows yeah, up. You're looking at the roster of the, the inmates coming in and mm-hmm. you see just one named Wolbert Bongle. I think that there's an element of like, just lose him on the way. Oh, like, yeah. You don't just, want him getting it. It's actually worse for him to get in the prison. Yeah. He's, he's going to cause more es- damage in there. Have him escape the bus. Right. That's that's like mm-hmm. transporting him there. You don't yeah. want to ruin your reputation. Hope that he gets into another jurisdiction and goes to a different prison. So a different deputy warden can deal with that. You, you take the prison wagon like on a big roundabout route to like leave him in. in uh, 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 gosh, what are the the purple knights? Where are they from? <laughs> Hold on. We got, I got to get the joke right. The purple knights. Uh, this is from uh, Faerun. Hold on, where are they from? Cormier. Oh yeah, you gotta take a long route through <laughs> Cormier, so that so that it becomes the Purple Knights problem. That's right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so Wilburn's in there, and he's like, "Listen, here's the deal. Give us." He's like, "We need something to smash out with." Hmm. You know, so we need like a hammer or something like that, and I'll get us out. I. I don't have a, a rogue or a thief, right? Okay. You know, I don't have any of this stuff. You know, very, it takes me a long time. It takes me like a full hour to like resolve this whole thing because mm-hmm. I'm trying to be sneaky because I'm afraid. And this is like good game design, I think. The prison's in a different map, right? Yeah. You got to like go through a loading screen to get there. Mm-hmm. If I hostile the people down here in the prison, will it hostile everyone in the tower? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I I truly don't know. So I'm like, you know, this indeterminacy in my mind, I guess I could like attack them, leave, see what happens. Right. Yeah. I don't do that. I'm, I, you know, I'm trying to play it straight up. And so I'm like, all right, I will try to resolve this without combat. So what I do is I get Lazel noted, uh, sneaky (laughs) creature Lazel. Sure. In full heavy armor. Oh, oh no. (laughs) I get Lazel. It's really cool. The the 
the whole tower is a circle or you know it's a it's a column from basement to tippy top yeah the so the prison's a circle it is a central tower a big air gap with some some bridges over it and then the the um prison on the outside of it right yeah so you can like go around the whole thing so i like scout the whole thing i do find a big fleshy hole in the ground that it looks like bodies were thrown into. Yep. And I actually tried to jump into it. You can't jump it, or I couldn't jump into it. Could you jump into it? Is this it's, jump intoable? It's jump intoable, yeah. Oh. I tried to do it and I like couldn't get the little thing to like verify. You know, Yeah, so the thing about the jump is in the same way for line of sight, there is this arc. And so you have to be the exact correct amount of space away from the wall. Otherwise, you're hitting the wall and it won't let you jump into a wall as opposed to like oh, the middle of the hole in the middle of the hole. Correct. Yeah. I yeah. just, I didn't, pl- I didn't play with it too much. I was like, Oh, can I jump into this? And I kind of got the red X and I was like, okay, whatever I'll leave. But I get Lazel sneaking around the central, um, tower in the middle of this prison is like where the warden's office is. So you can like sneak up to the top. You can do some jumping and maybe that's actually why I chose Lazel thinking about it is I think her jump, because she's very athletic. And she's got Giff like, Yankee jump, like a special racial j- super jump. I don't think I'm to that point where that unlocks yet. You definitely are, because that's an act one thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe mm-hmm. I had it, but I didn't need it, maybe. Yeah. Um, so she's boop, 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 boop. She jumps all the way up. And there, there's a patrol route, you know? Yeah, like, no. And, the, and it's and a prison. Yeah, and like a lot of those scrying eyes kind of mm-hmm. like overlapping and patrolling and moving yeah. through. Yep. And so I sneak into the office. There's like a little ledge you can stand on. And I sneak into the office and I like accidentally get into combat and I reload. And then I get into the office. I loot the whole thing as Lazel sneaking around, hitting the sneak button. I leave. I walk on the the big stone rafters Mm. to the and I because I don't have like a, you know, a mace or anything. Sure. I get a, there. There are some in there. I get that. I scooch on over. Do, 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 do. I walk over the rafter and throw the uh, mace into the cell from the rafter, where I assume no one can see me. Hmm. I think I'm wrong <laughs> about that. Okay. Uh, because ultimately I do end up in combat after oh, all darn. of this work that I do. And I think mm-hmm. you kind of have to, because I do believe that like it initiates combat when they start their prison break. Basically, Wolbrin is like, Hey, um, I'm, we're going to, I'm going to knock out the back wall here and I'll take the tieflings with me and we can like hook up later. Now, let me see what happens. Yeah. I'm looking at my footage. No, what occurs is they start the prison break. And then that starts combat. And I guess I could like defend them or just ignore them. And I yeah. Them. So I means. think that yeah. uh, there are enough scrying eyes. It is possible. Uh, and on a previous playthrough to like mm. very diligently. And this is this is a time consuming affair mm-hmm. to kind of like set go into turn base mode while patrols are in specific areas and like alpha down the scrying eyes. Without other yeah, people you can, being you aware. can uh, Scry and I, you can attack with impunity. Yes. Which is interesting to me. Um, but well, it, you get a round, basically. Or you might get two rounds. Like on, on, the, on round mm-hmm. one of combat, the first action will be, I'm going to alert people. And then on subsequent rounds, everything yeah. in the area will become hostile. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so I, I think that it is possible to like eliminate enough si- lines of sight that... No one no notices one sees them escape. Correct. But yeah. you've got to kill like a large number of people in order to actually do that. Well, I ended up killing a large number of people by uh, in good old fashioned traditional fifth edition combat. Sure. Uh, and we got we fought on a little bridge and that was fun. It was good because they're all in the wardens area. A big bunch of the guards are in the wardens tower. Right. Yeah. Now, something very funny and people will be able to see the footage of this. Something very funny that happened is like. While, you know, the tieflings and the gnomes are escaping, they break through the wall and they find this like little area and you can see it on the map, you know, while they're doing it because they're in initiative. You can watch them take their actions. Uh, They find this little dock, right? Yeah. The gnomes run to the dock and begin like smashing uh, the ropes that keep the 
uh, what do you call it? Like the boat. Yeah, the raft moored. Right. The tieflings immediately turn around and begin like looting weapons out of barrels and stuff and mm-hmm. start fighting. Fighting who? The guards. They come oh. like way back and start fighting the guards. Oh, because they're, they're like in, almost all the way to the thing. They're in initiative order and like yeah. because the boat is not available, they don't pile into the boat. They Because they have to break the boat. Yeah, I don't know. The AI here, because you would assume they would all just like crowd the boat, beat the moorings, you know, destroy them with their melee attacks and then go from there. But no, they like loot weapons and then start running back into combat. So the the thing you can do, if you were able to jump into that uh, fleshy hole that you mentioned, Uh there's a way out of that fleshy hole. Oh, Um, and the way out is accessible behind the prison cells. Mm-hmm. So it is possible for the player to get behind the prison cells before Wolbrin has like created a hole. Mm-hmm. And then you can go to the dock and destroy that rope. You can pre-destroy it. Oh, and get a, get a, kind of prep it for him. I mean, and here here you go. You can also just like destroy the walls from back behind there. It'd be like I'm. I'm here to get you. I'm here to get you. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. Fun. That's that's that is good design, top to bottom. I like yeah. that. There's a lot of different ways to do this. I'm actually now that I'm talking about the prison, I'm sad I didn't do it this playthrough. The prison's good. <laughs> like the, the prison's the, good. It's a, a good cool, area, and it took me probably yeah, 45 minutes or so to do like the whole thing here because mm-hmm. there was a lot of like sneaking around, both in turn based turn based mode and not turn based mode, and like keeping paying attention. And I kind of like that. I'm not mad that I tried to do it one way and it didn't work out the way I wanted it to because that felt like kind of a real scenario, right? It felt a lot like a tabletop game where it's like, yeah. sometimes you just fail that check, you know? Yeah. And, and the weird swerve of the AI of them being like, no, we're defending ourselves. That made me be like, okay, we're fighting on this bridge. That's very far away from where these new guards just came in to beat up these tieflings. I got to run over there like ASAP. Yeah. That's, like I... I understand why lots of the combats in this game do not change halfway through because that is generally not a fun part of tactical role playing game combat. Right? What do you mean that, like, change halfway through? Like that, reset positions? No, not reset positions, but like that big transformations occur midway through the fight, right? So like what happens in this fight is that we the I'm fighting the prison guards while the mm-hmm. people are escaping. The people who are escaping come back in the middle of the fight, and then that brought in more guards because they had not been, um, what do you uh, uh, aggroed yet? Because they were like ah, out yeah. of the thing, right? Mm-hmm. And so that and that changed the the stakes of the fight. It changed where the fight was taking place, right? Yes. Now I got right. So like there was a big um, stakes change for me as a player. My my first thing was I need to get these guards down as quickly as possible because they are powerful and they are scary and I'm worried that they might kill me and then kill these you know, like uh, creatures. Right. In reality, I'll have to reload the game. Right. Yeah. In the middle of the fight, it turned into, oh, no, these tieflings are very squishy and I need to get over there and protect them. And it matters more to keep them from dying ASAP than it does for me to like, uh, you know, power down these guards. That is really cool. That's also hard to design in a way that feels fair, right? Like, it's hard to put that into the game purposefully. And I really don't think that there are very many fights in this game that have a pivot in the middle of them. Uh, There's a fight in Act 3 where there are... I don't want to spoil anything, but there uh, it kind of takes place in the corner of uh, the Baldur's Gate map, if you know what I'm talking about here. Mm -hmm. And it's there are some, we'll just say, cultists... Right. Yes. Uh, running around and in combat, they just start attacking civilians rather than you. Mm-hmm. And that's really cool to be like, oh, my priorities are very different in this fight. I need yes. to keep these civilians alive rather than that. I really like that stuff. And there's just not that much of it in the game uh, because I don't think that's the way that D&D combat like D&D module design doesn't really lean that way. No, for the, the whole part. system is is kind of ar- arranged around Every match is a death match, mm-hmm. um, and I Between know two that two parties where yes. the st- where the stakes are set um, from beginning to end very clearly at the beginning. Yeah, and for the most part, you know, if you look at module writing, the vast majority of fights are just kind of like 
assumed to be to the death. That is what you are fighting over. You are fighting over yeah. somebody dies, somebody lives. But they, they've gotten better about that over the years. But well, I mean, and also if you just like yeah. look at a lot of other RPG writing outside yeah. of just fifth edition, there's just a lot more emphasis on what are what are people doing? What do they actually want? Do the cultists yeah. really want to like? kill you or are they just to cause you know out to cause chaos yeah etc are, are, are is this ogre actually going to uh wants to smash you or do they do they have ulterior motives right, right. etc so yeah. i think that uh, the infusion and especially because it's a surprise because 90 percent of the fights in this game are okay well we are just fighting until we're all you know one side is completely dead yeah. having a wrench thrown into that I think it, it kind of enlivens the fight. It it, it, yeah. it it certainly gets my attention. Well, you know, we talked about it a few episodes back, but like the fight with the spectator where it uh, unpetrifies and then dominates those party members and you can like break the concentration on that or, or you know, undominate them and then they'll yes. fight with you. That's a pivot in the middle of that fight that's very cool. Yes. And I just I, I just wish there was a little bit more of that in the game. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, if we think about the fights that we have done so far... A lot of the highlights for me are, in fact, fights where there is some weird third party stuff going on. Yeah. Um, the near fight being an, an example of mm -hmm, like there's yeah. a lot of permutations where the near fight can do that. The spectator fight is one of them. Even the owl bear fight and having those two people like those two cultists in there. That's kind of interesting. But mm -hmm. yeah, um, the, and, and I think, you know, this, this is I want to make it clear. This is not me like complaining about the combat of this game. It, it is actually to the game's credit that these things happen in the game. Right. Yeah. Like you can imagine a world in which none of that is in there. I just wish it, you know, it's maybe 10 percent of fights or maybe one fifteenth of the fights. I wish it were, you know, one seventh or something. I wish sure. there were just a few more of them uh, mm -hmm. going on. They escape and you have the option to be like, meet me at the end of the last light. Get on your boat. I'll see you there. Or you can be like, I'll go with you. I'll get on the boat and wherever we go, because everything's like surrounded in mist fog. You know what yeah. I mean? We end up at the docks. Have you done this? Yes, I have done this in a previous playthrough. You get you have to go through customs. Yeah, you got to like talk to a uh, Harper. I was like, let's go to the end of the last light. Let's go to the docks. Whatever. And this is a long sequence. Like, they it really is. let you dwell here on. And, like, they are, consciously or not, they are telling you everything you need to know about the Harpers. About, yes. like, what this deal is. The Harper, they're like, look, we are not letting anyone who's tadpoled here. And I'm like, well, these are the tieflings who are just with you. And they're, like, our people. You know what I mean? And these are a bunch of gnomes who are, like, imprisoned for who knows what, right? Like, they're not cultists and they're like yeah but um we're gonna ins have to inspect them all and there's an in engine you know it's not a cutscene. it is an in engine it makes everyone line up against the wall and the harper goes by with its little tadpole in a in a you know a bug in a jar a little light you know uh lightning bug in a jar and inspects all of them individually one by one in a scripted sequence yeah it's long. Yes. It's long. Yes. We're 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 having to really be confronted with a specific ideology that the game <laughs> I don't know if the game if the game is in on it or not mm -hmm. about like what does the quote unquote what do the quote unquote good guys have to look like in in the world that is being depicted? Yeah. And apparently that is the security state. That so is. I uh, I just set my camera up. I put my my people off screen and I set my camera up and just like walked away from this. And I recorded the entire inspection scene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in a little like POV. So people be able to see that. Probably not the whole thing, but you get to see them doing that. Um, the I went and talked to Jahira a little bit and then I talked to Wolbrin Bongle and he was like, thanks so much. I'm out of here. I'm donezo. I'm now, did Barkus and Wolbrin have a reunion? Because Barkus has been trying to find Wolbrin this whole time. Barkus still down in the Grimforge. Barkus does not come to the end of the last light. Really? Nope. They meet in Baldur's Gate. Interesting. Spoiler. So you can 
convince Barkus to come to your camp. Did you were, oh. were you able to convince Barkus to come to your camp? No, I didn't try to. I just thought he had his dudes and they were going to do their own thing. Gotcha. Okay, so if he comes to the camp, he does end up in the last slide in, but there is mm. basically no interaction between him and Wolverine while he's oh, there. So you didn't miss too much. So uh, last thing about the prison break, the tieflings come out. You know what I mean? Like our two tiefling adventurers. And they're like, Roland, where is he? Lo and behold, ah. drunk ass Roland has, uh, you know, he got his courage up, a little bit of liquid courage. He's now out in the shadow curse looking for these goofballs. He was going to go solo all of Moonrise Tower to get him out. He was doing a Balthazar. Dang. He's casting nine cantrips a turn. Mm hmm. Or whatever. So I'm going to have to go get him later. But that's the next stage of this quest. Okay. Tell me about the environs. Sure. Oh, you know what? I, actually, let me just let me close that up because it's easy to do. Yeah. Go ahead and tell me what happened to uh, Roland. He's here. getting his ass kicked 200 yards out, 200 meters to the the, the, mm -hmm. the metric people. <laughs> uh, he's getting his ass kicked like right outside, like down the block. And you can go rescue him. And he's so ashamed. But he does come back and they all reunite. It's Dang, okay. my first playthrough, uh, that combat, you know, you stumble upon it, and if you are not fast, he he dies. Yes, so it's like a bunch of shadow moss creatures, whatever they are, these plant, undead plant beings, and uh, yeah, you, I mean, you can see it happening from far away. Basically, as soon as he's, like, renderable, the combat begins, and if you don't hustle over there, or, like, put it, I just put it in turn-based mode immediately, so I could, like, dash and sprint and do all that stuff, uh, but yeah, if you don't do that, he gets mobbed pretty quick and, and gets taken out. Gotcha. This Cow. isn't an extra long episode. This is a normal episode. This is a normal episode. It's still like it's it's still longer than, uh, you know, my preference. My preference is the tight, you know, 59 minutes. Danny uh, just doesn't believe in uh, that, that the episode link should uh, just uh, uh, conform to content rather that content should uh, conform to episode link. Um, but that's acceptable. Patreon.com slash range touch is where you want to go. Next episode, we're going to be talking about all the other stuff around Moonrise. Uh, mm -hmm. There's like a little murdered out town there. We're going to be learning about that. I will say a little preview. Um, act two is the grab bag of random stuff. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I think it's fun that it all coheres around. I, I like the idea that the shadow curse is the thing that makes it cohere together there is a reason for all this stuff but in terms of like individual stuff it's just some some things yeah um and and it feels very much like a like a, a tightly done fifth edition splat book or or um, module but we'll get to that next time we're going to talk about a bunch of those things in the next episode we'll be back in two weeks hit the subscribe button if you haven't already hit the like button to let us know what is up if you want to hear this as a podcast it is available on youtube music or whatever that is it is enabled as a podcast you can just listen to it if you want and also there's a free rss feed down in the description if you want to put that into your podcatcher of course of course of choice we'll be back in two weeks with some additional moonrise stuff and uh, we'll be finishing up act two in a couple episodes ciao <laughs> Wise, 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 wise.